Distinguished guests, academic colleagues, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia ora koutou katoa. And welcome to Victoria University, the inaugural lecturer of Professor John Creedy. I'm Professor Fraser Allen, Deputy Vice-Chancellor Engagement at Victoria University, and it is my pleasure to host you this evening. In 2011, Victoria was lucky to attract Professor Creedy from the University of Melbourne, where he was the Truby Williams Professor of Economics. Professor Creedy initially took leave from Melbourne to undertake a three-year stint at Victoria, but in 2014 officially made Wellington home and became a permanent member of staff. Professor Creedy currently spends half of his time with the School of Accounting and Commercial Law, where he lectures in economics, and half of his time in the tax strategy uh, section of the New Zealand Treasury. Professor Creedy's career has taken him to many corners of the globe. After first graduating from the University of Bristol and then Oxford University in 1972, he promptly found himself back in the classroom, this time as a young lecturer in his native United Kingdom. He then went to Pennsylvania State University, to Melbourne, and now to Victoria. His areas of research are diverse, and he has established an international reputation for his work in labour economics, public economics, and the history of economic thought. His work in these fields, particularly in economic modelling, has important applications for some of the big issues of our time. Issues that touch on all levels of society, both locally and globally, such as inequality and income distribution, pensions and the ageing population, and environmental tax. Professor Creedy has also lent his research skills and expertise directly to the public service. For example, in 1978, he was a research officer at the National Institute of Economic and Social Research in the United Kingdom, working on the state earnings related pension scheme. Professor Creedy has published extensively throughout his career. At last count, he has published 36 books, edited 17 books, written 58 book chapters, and around 275 journal articles, a phenomenal achievement. And I'm sure there are plenty more to come. In his address tonight, Professor Creedy will be focusing on modelling and answering the intriguing question, are economic models a toy shop or practical workshop? Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, please welcome Professor John Creedy. Thank you very much. Well, <coughs> having waited uh, 38 years from my uh, first chair appointment to give an inaugural, I thought I'd missed out on something. Uh, but now I realize that actually it's a terrifying task to be faced with. And uh, I really had difficulty knowing what to say. And I thought back to uh, the very first conference I went to as a very young uh, green lecturer and found myself sitting next to an eminent British economist who thought he was being very pleasant when he turned to me and said, uh, so what sort of economist are you? And I have to say I was utterly terrified and tongue-tied and uh, fortunately saved by someone sitting next to me who said something pretty inane, but it rescued me. Uh, but now I think if I were to be asked that question, I'd still have a sort of terror in my stomach, but I'd probably say uh, that I'm some kind of modeler, some kind of economic modeler. And so I thought, well, that will give me my subject for uh, this evening. And then I immediately thought of the great Alfred Marshall, this great British economist, leading economist of the late 19th century and early 20th century. And Marshall, when writing about his own work on international trade, Marshall wrote a very important uh, piece on international trade, which really extended 
in some very important ways earlier work of John Stuart Mill. But Marshall said in correspondence that these models belong to the economic toy shop rather than the practical workshop. And uh, this statement of Marshall, I think you could say, has uh, haunted me uh, really throughout my career as a modeler because it's always been at the back of my mind uh, to try and avoid uh, the toy shop rather than the workshop. And indeed, it's, it's not difficult to think of uh, common vices of modelers. And uh, I won't claim to have avoided all of these vices at some time or other. Uh, but the first is believing the model is the real world. You, it's uh, quite common when people have poured over a model to, to think it is a real world and to make very strong policy recommendations on, on the back of a model which may be rather too abstract. Another common failing uh, is to ignore the time dimension, and this goes back to the famous classical economist David Ricardo, and so it's named after him, but Ricardo was uh, prone to collapse the long and the short run, to forget that uh, many changes would involve adjustments that would take place over time. So the Ricardian vice is certainly one that uh, one can um, fall into. And there's another group of models where uh, people are not really interested in the real world. They're interested in the mechanics of the model. And we might say they're more interested in turning the handle on a set of models uh, rather than uh, talking about something relevant. And we can all find examples of those. Now, you, you may expect, having, having said this that, uh, tonight, that I might sort of uh, give some kind of apologia, a sort of old-fashioned inaugural lecture, which is quite common to do that sort of thing. Uh, I'm not going to do that. Indeed, I did start to look at a lot of literature uh, on modeling by methodology people. And uh, I found, uh, after a painfully long time, none of these papers uh, were written by people who produced a model. And uh, I didn't find them all that helpful. So I started to try and produce a taxonomy of models, thinking of pedagogic models and models that might rely on calibration and other types. And I found that really uh, I couldn't produce a, a clear taxonomy either. And so uh, I would tend to uh, adopt um, Duke Ellington's comment when he talked about music. He said there are only two kinds, uh, good and bad. And uh, that's my view about economic models. And uh, really, I think it, it, we could say Alfred Marshall uh, really was too hard on himself. But this is Marshall, who I should point out uh, was a very skilled, highly trained mathematician who put all his maths into appendices. He was incredibly original when it came to producing diagrams in economics, probably a real pioneer in the use of diagrams. He put those into footnotes. So for Marshall, these things were almost a guilty pleasure. And in fact, uh, the piece of work that Marshall was denigrating has actually been incredibly important uh, work on international trade. So um, I'm going to say some general comments about modeling, and then I'll talk about some specific models that, that I've been associated with. And uh, I really just want to make three Points. As I said, I've eschewed the um, sort of deep methodological uh, papers on this. And so uh, I've, I thought, well, if we want something really deep about models, let's turn to a comedian, a stand-up comedian, who didn't even know he was talking about models. So how, how good is that? He makes a profound statement about them without knowing he was talking about them. Uh, this is uh, Stephen Wright, who, is, uh, some of you may know, is a very good American a uh, comic whose act consists of just a stream of um, one-liners, uh, rather surreal. But Stephen Wright, uh, one of his one-liners, I can't tell jokes, I'm bound to mess this up, but uh, he said, last year I bought a map of the world, full scale. I've spent the summer trying to fold it. <laughs> so this, I, I think, is a really good statement about models. You know, you, you can't produce a model of the real world. It's just impossible. It's too complicated. We need models. And the map analogy is very good. 
Um, I've actually never come across a decent map of New Zealand yet. I'm still looking for one. Uh, but of course, the kind of map we want, I can see Veronica is saying, you know, it's usually sat nav. Um, but, uh, you know, if we want to drive from here to Auckland, we need a different kind of map than one if we want to hike ac uh, across the hills. You know? So I think this is a deep statement about modeling, and it's, it's as deep as you'll get from me. Um, something that people uh, know me probably heard me say many times, uh, when it comes to models, there are horses for courses. And uh, it may sound rather um, platitudinous, but really uh, we have to keep in mind that we build models for specific purposes. And I think one, it can be rather dangerous to try to use a model for one purpose uh, for which it wasn't designed. Uh, the, the term Procrustean bed comes to mind, and I've seen this problem uh, many times where pe people are trying to extend a model that really wasn't designed for purpose. But I think, too, it also reminds us that, that you know, there are horses who are, that are bred for short races. And the same with models. There are models that are designed for a specific, narrow purpose. They may be built by one or two people, and then they may be put aside after they've been used. And uh, the value, if you like, has been uh, obtained from them. But then there are other models that are stayers, uh, models that we really need to maintain, models that need development by a team of people and need resources devoted to them. And uh, I should be saying something about these uh, kind of models late, later on. And the other thing we have to be aware of when we're talking about models is don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And this is actually the most difficult challenge. Uh, anyone uh, trying to build a model, as I've said, you have to simplify. You have to simplify as much as possible. Um, Occam's razor comes to mind, obviously, but we really have to simplify. But the challenge is don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You don't throw out what you really need uh, in the model. Again, these, these things sound like platitudes, uh, but for anyone uh, with experience of building models, they'll know how difficult this challenge is because one can often subconsciously um, throw the baby out by assumptions that you may regard as uh, quite innocent initially. Okay, so uh, what am I going to discuss? Well, uh, faced with a difficult selection problem, I will talk about some models, and I hope to convince you that um, you know some models at least do belong to the workshop rather than the, the toy shop, the academic toy shop. And I'm going to talk about models, basically, that um, involve clearly framed policy questions. And in my own experience, I've found it invaluable, really, from the beginning of my career to maintain contact with economists in government departments, because that way one can really learn what the questions of the day are. And uh, I, I might add that this is something that I value, uh, in particular, in my present appointment, which is half-time at the Treasury. So we start with a clearly framed policy question. Actually, getting people to frame their questions clearly is quite a challenge, too. Uh, it's not an easy thing. Um, people will say, oh, uh, can you construct a, you know, a model of international trade flows? And you say, well, what actually is it that you want to know? And that's not an easy question uh, to get answers to. Uh, also, the kind of models that I've been associated with really from the beginning of my career involve some kind of computer modeling, uh, often with large actual or simulated numbers of individuals. So um, I consider myself lucky in some ways that I came into the profession at a time when at least it was possible to have access uh, to mainframe computers and uh, computer language that you know, wasn't too difficult. Uh, I didn't have to uh, program in machine code. And of course, uh, we want our models to be able to look at the implications of policy changes. Again, some of these things sound so platitudinous, uh, but we have to keep this in mind when we're modeling. And what I'm really getting at here 
is something which is a sort of hobby horse of mine, and that is that I believe models should pro provide a tool for rational policy analysis. And what I mean by this is that uh, any policy recommendation uh, has behind it a set of value judgments, uh, ethical, political judgments. But the role of the economist is, is not to uh, try and persuade people that his or her uh, ethical judgments are superior, but to provide the kind of information that can be fed into policy debate. So you can show people the implications of making particular assumptions or the implications of adopting certain values. And uh, quite just to mention quickly, I've seen a lot of changes over time. I can, um, if I start talking about changes in, in hardware, I can very quickly envisage the um, four Yorkshiremen sketch of Monty Python. Uh, if any of you rem remember that, is uh, you start to tell people what it was like and they just won't believe you. Um, you know, I, I, I was once uh, called into the computer unit in, in my university and given a slap over the wrist for taking up masses of computer time, and I was just doing a simulation with 300 individuals. You know. now, now, if you did that, you'd just get laughed, laughed at for using such a tiny number of individuals. And of course, we have software changes too. The first simulation programs I wrote, I had to write, write the routines for generating random numbers. Of course, now you, can, you know, there's masses of very sophisticated software that's available to us. And then the most important thing, uh, which is really fantastic, is the increased access to micro data. And uh, I've been going on and on and on about this in New Zealand. It's a much better situation than it used to be, uh, but it is still quite difficult for academics in New Zealand to get access to micro data. And ag again, I should say that a, a lot of the work that I've been doing wouldn't be possible if, if I were a full-time academic here. Um, that really access to the data via the Treasury uh, has made so much more work feasible. Okay, let me um, move on. The, I'm not going chronologically now. I want to talk about behavioral micro-simulation modeling, particularly tax micro-simulation modeling. And I've put this first because I do think it is a very good example of a model which is a stayer in the, in the sense that it's the kind of model that we need over a, a long period, but also is exemplary in providing uh, the kind of policy advice that, that's really necessary. And um, let me give you a brief New Zealand-Australia story. Uh, it's actually a very long story, so I'll keep it uh, as short as possible. And um, you know, I'll, I'll avoid mentioning names uh, to protect the innocent. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it really, my involvement in microsimulation really goes back to a piece of work that I was asked to do while at Melbourne by the New, New Zealand Treasury. And uh, the manager of the tax section uh, asked me to write a, re a review of concepts and measurement of the excess burden of taxation. Now, the economists here will know immediately what an excess burden is. It's one of the most important concepts in tax analysis. And what it's very simply getting at is the idea that a tax will distort people's behavior. That distortion involves them in a loss of welfare. And that loss of welfare exceeds the amount of tax they pay. So there's this uh, additional loss. We might say, well, the tax is used for a good purpose, so that's OK. Um, but there is this other loss that we can't do anything about, the excess burden. And so the people in the Treasury at that time were very concerned. How could they measure these e excess burdens uh, in New Zealand? Well, it turned out that um, I rashly took on this, this project uh, and found myself faced with a huge literature and ended up writing a book. But at the end of the day, 
after doing this, I thought, well, this, uh, the best kind of work here for doing this is, is a tax micro simulation model. So I went to the director of the Melbourne Institute of Economic and Social Research, a very far-sighted person, Peter Dawkins at that time. And I said, Peter, the, Me the Melbourne Institute needs a model. And uh, a micro simulation model is just the kind it needs because then it can contribute to the debate. As soon as the de there's a debate about tax policy changes, the Melbourne Institute can get in on the act and uh, get some publicity for itself and also contribute importantly to this rational policy debate. And uh, well, again, part of a long story, but we managed to get funding for what I've written here is MITS, the Melbourne Institute Tax and Transfer Simulator. And again, this is the kind of project that needs funding. So it wouldn't really be carried out in a normal economics department. It was important that we had the resources of the Melbourne Institute and a very sympathetic dean. But it also needs teamwork because it's such a large project. And uh, I'm going to be using uh, the, the word we uh, subsequently, and that's really a changeable group of people uh, involved with this kind of modeling. And then when I came to New Zealand first in, uh, to spend 2002 and 2003 here on leave, uh, we actually managed to get MITs converted for New Zealand purposes. That's a, another long story that uh, I'll just have to miss out here. Uh, unfortunately, uh, although that produced what was called then Tax Mod B, uh, it was produced just too late to look at the working for families reform. And I'm sure most people here know that uh, one of the motivations for introducing working for families was to improve or to increase labor supply. So uh, all this policy debate took place in an environment where no one was able to look at these uh, labor supply effects of a new tax, uh, which is rather a shame. Uh, also, the movement didn't all go one way. When I was here uh, earlier on, um, we, and as a, as a different set of we's here, um, we introduced sample reweighting or calibration into the Treasury's model, which is really uh, in a sample survey, you have to give each individual a weight so that you can get population values from it. And uh, if you're using a survey collected in one period, and you want to say something about changes in another period, then one thing you want to do is try to capture the changing structure of the population. So you need to reweight the survey. And uh, after we'd worked out how to do this, then I took all this back to Melbourne and uh, we, we introduced it and made a lot of use of it. Now, let me go back to this excess burden uh, concept. I said it's a welfare change uh, it's a welfare change in excess of the tax paid. So we have to have some way of, of measuring this welfare change. And uh, here I'm reminded of uh, Oscar Wilde's statement that I'm sure many people will know. Uh, his definition of a cynic is someone who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. Uh, so I can say, well, that's all very well. We're economists. We know how to value things in money terms. And there are measures, money measures of the welfare change that are central here. And so uh, we, if we can pause for a, a few minutes for a welfare economics lesson, we have two measures to measure this welfare change. One is you ask, what's the maximum amount the individual is prepared to pay after a change to go back to the old structure. So if you have a tax change that changes prices, you're saying, what's the most you'd be prepared to pay to go back to the old prices? That's one measure that's called an equivalent variation. Another measure is a compensating variation, and that asks, what's the minimum you need to give someone after the tax change with those taxes in, in, in existence to make that person as well off as before? In other words, to make that person indifferent between the initial situation and the new situation. So we have these two measures. They're all due to um, John Hicks, famous British economist, first British Nobel uh, Prize winner. I'm, I'm quite proud to say that I attended Hicks's last 
seminar series on uh, welfare economics, but I can't remember a single thing he said about welfare changes. He, he made a big impression on me, but I, I can't remember uh, him talking about those changes. He, he was just an incredibly stimulating uh, person. Okay, so that was what uh, drove the search for how you measure these equivalent and compensating variations. Uh, that led to the production, basically, of uh, Australia and New Zealand's uh, tax micro simulation models. Uh, I've defined them in you know, less than a minute, uh, but actually they're incredibly hard to measure. Uh, I'll say a few things about that later. So these, these models are, are, are not much use unless we pay attention to some details. We need to be able to examine in detail, to model in detail, the changes in the direct tax and benefit system. As you'll know, we have a very complicated tax and benefit system. If we want to think about reforming it, uh, we have to be able to change you know, exact um, components of the system. It, it's no good saying uh, when a minister asks, what do we think about changing a, a particular marginal tax rate? We can't say, oh, well, actually, the model only, only assumes proportional taxes. You know, that's no use at all. Uh, we have to have a model that grabs every component of the system, and that's what these models do. They have to capture full extent of population heterogeneity. Tax changes benefit some people and they harm other people. So we need to know who benefits, who gets harmed. Why is it that certain groups benefit and why is it others get harmed? Do we worry about the people who are harmed? Uh, are the people who benefit really the people we wanted to benefit? So again, these tax models must be able to capture that. And uh, this is done through being able to use the, something like the Household Economic Survey, cross-sectional survey, representative survey of uh, New Zealand households. And then we have to model the uh, labour supply of individuals. And this is where it gets pretty tricky, because if we, if we think about it, we've got lots of marginal tax rates. We've got benefits with uh, abatement rates. And so any individual, if you think about varying that individual's hours of work, increasing their income, they go through a whole range of different effective marginal tax rates. Sometimes the effective marginal tax rate falls. If the individual exhausts their entitlement to a means-tested benefit, suddenly their effective rate drops. And so we've got ranges over which rates drop and rates increase. Even though we don't have a lot of uh, marginal income tax rates, the interaction with the benefit system means that there are quite a large number of effective marginal rates faced by individuals. And so people are making a joint decision. When they make a decision about how much to work, they're effectively making a decision about what tax rate they want to face. In, a, in other words, both of these things are endogenous. They, they're joint decisions. And this, overcoming this endogeneity is part of the, the difficulty that we face in doing this modeling. And the way it's done in, in, in our models is to assume that individuals have only access to a discrete number of hours that they can work in, that they have a preference function defined over their net income and their hours of work. Obviously, hours of work contribute negatively to their welfare. And that this preference function uh, allows for lots of characteristics of the household, so we have lots of heterogeneity there. But there's also a random utility component, a random component to these preferences. And again, I'm sort of addressing the economists here, but that means that we have a multinomial logic model that we can estimate. Um, put briefly, all it means is that we can go through a lot of manipulations and find at the end of the day that we can generate a probability distribution over the hours worked. So we can't say this individual will go from working 20 hours to working 25 hours. We can attach a probability to working a certain number of hours after the reform. So uh, you might say, well, this is not very precise. It's a cost we pay uh, to get over this endogeneity problem uh, that the tax rate and the labor supply are jointly determined. So let me mention also some 
uh, sorry, let's, I'm rushing on here. Uh, the model also needs to be able to judge the effect of any change using lots of different metrics. So we need a, basically what I call a back end of the model uh, that can give us a lot of different measures. And as I've said before, I think this kind of model has long-term value because debates about the tax system never stop. You know, everybody is affected by the tax system. Uh, everybody has their point of view. And so we'll never settle on uh, any agreed ideal tax system. Now, I mentioned horses for courses, so we should be aware uh, of these models. I strongly believe that they are of the practical workshop, not the toy shop, but we should be aware of their limitations too. Uh, it's a comparative static model. Bit of a Ricardian vice about this. We only talk about the uh, change in, from one position to another, ignoring how long it might take. So it's basically assuming this change takes place instantaneously. There's no attempt to model things like educational choice, family formation, fertility, early retirement, this kind of thing. We know they can be important. We know that changes to the welfare system can provide incentives regarding household formation, for example. Changes to the tax system can affect people's attitude about whether they want to stay on for uh, ed tertiary education, this sort of thing. We can't model everything. We have to have a horses for courses. This is uh, limited in some ways. And I talked about the preferences. The preference functions that we deal with don't allow for government expenditure. So they don't allow for the fact that the government might be spending the revenue on infrastructure projects that these people think is a good idea. And they don't resent paying that tax. That, uh, it sounds as if we ought to include it. It's, it's actually incredibly difficult, even in simple models. Now, I'm relieved to see um, everyone is still seated. I gave a talk in Auckland not too long ago. And when I, when I mentioned this assumption, uh, a well-known New Zealand economist got up and stormed out in high dudgeon uh, in offense at this assumption. So I'm, I'm glad that um, we all remained here, at least. You're all too polite. Um, and of course, we focus on the supply side of the labor market only. So, you know, when these changes take place in labor supply, we might expect changes in wage rates required to absorb changes in the supply. But it's not dealt with in this kind of model. Uh, I've done a lot of thinking about this kind of problem, and um, ultimately it goes into the too hard basket. And a, and a preference for keeping a model designed for a specific purpose rather than trying uh, to tack on a general equilibrium part to it. But it means we have to take great care in interpreting results. We can't simply ask our treasury modelers, and uh, I'm looking at one of them now, uh, to, to run a simulation and tell us what's going to happen. Uh, we know that when we see those results, we have to look at them uh, very carefully. OK, let me just uh, talk about these challenges. I've pretty much talked about these. I'm not going to talk in length. Um, just let me say that although the initial stimulus to produce these models came from a request to talk about measuring excess burdens, equivalent and compensating variations, uh, it turned out to be very difficult. First of all, there's a standard method available uh, that didn't work. We realized didn't work when we have many effective marginal tax rates. And then we had this challenge of uh, how do we deal with it when we've got this random component that allows for imperfect optimization by people. So it took us some time to devise uh, a workable method um, to do this. And the irony is, although it's this question that got the whole thing going in Australia and New Zealand, uh, we can't do it in the New Zealand model. So this is something uh, to look forward to. Uh, so that's as much as I'm going to say about uh, micro-simulation modeling. Um, I'm actually taking longer to say this than I, than I had planned, so I'm going to miss out some of this 
a talk. But let me go back to the beginning of my career and talk about a particular kind of uh, modeling uh, that I started with. And this is the place to pay tribute to my supervisor, uh, Alan Brown. Um, Alan Brown was actually the architect and main driving force behind the Cambridge growth model, uh, which is still in existence after many years. Um, I would say to people, please, if you, if you have any interest at all in this, uh, just put his name and mine into Google, and you can download a memoir that I wrote about him, or you can email me and I'll send you the memoir. So I'll go very quickly over that. But I basically have felt during my whole career uh, that I am following in, in Alan's footsteps in the, in the kind of modeling that I think uh, and hope he would have approved of. Um, and he really started me working by saying he thought I should work on the changing distribution of income over the life cycle. So uh, as we know, there's a systematic pattern of uh, earnings change over the life cycle, but there are also uh, relative income changes. People move within the distribution of their contemporaries. And uh, we wanted to model that process. And when I started, I thought, you know, even then I was, I was aware of Alfred Marshall and his comment, and I thought, oh, gosh, this is um, a bit too statistical. Uh, there's, there's not a lot of economic modeling here. There were some statistical challenges. I would have done anything that Alan Brown suggested. Uh, but then I realized that some famous economists, Solo, in particular uh, Milton Friedman, had started their careers looking at income distribution issues. So I thought, well, that's okay. And so I started working on this, and I'm going to go very quickly. I'm not going to mention these because there isn't time. And uh, managed to do quite a lot of work on income distribution problems. And then suddenly, um, a policy fell into my lap, if you like, that was just exactly uh, the right kind of policy that needed the kind of model that I'd been building. And this was the introduction in the UK of the state earnings related pension scheme. And what this did was to uh, introduce a 20 best years rule. So pensionable earnings were based on the best 20 years of the individual with a bit of adjustment uh, going on here. And uh, I called the government actuary's department and said, you know, well, how had they estimated the cost of this scheme? It turned out they'd uh, done it on the back of the envelope. They'd basically drawn an average age income profile, drawn a horizontal line so that they got 20 years uh, above the line, and averaged that. that. They were their estimates. So I thought, well, fantastic. I now have a real policy question that I can use my uh, lifetime model for. And uh, I found estimates that were 20% higher than the government actuaries department. And uh, they invited me um, to go along and talk about this. And uh, I thought this was very kind of them, but I didn't realize at the time they invited me there just to beat me up. <laughs> you know. Uh, I came out of there thinking, you know, I was very, very badly bruised. They didn't like to be told that there were uh, other ways of doing this that would give 20% more. 20% is a non-trivial <laughs> increase in the cost of a public pension scheme. Well, a few months later, uh, they issued a new paper uh, that revised their estimates. And, of course, they didn't mention me, but amazingly, um, by coincidence, they increased their costings by 20%. So, so it's a good lesson, really. Uh, you can make great use of these models, but don't expect always to be thanked uh, for what you do. Uh, you know, have to treat these people carefully. Okay. Then when I came to Australia, I found that there was a compulsory superannuation scheme uh, being introduced. Now, I have this idea that uh, there was a national competition uh, that took place. And this competition said, uh, can you devise the most complicated superannuation scheme imaginable so that the scheme itself is, is so complicated no one will understand it, and it interacts with the benefit system, uh, lots of means testing there, in a, in a way which will give tax accountants lots of money 
uh, when they come to advise their clients is a very complicated scheme. And um, what it did was to say, well, we need compulsory superannuation because people are so short-sighted. And so you give them compulsory superannuation and, and then you let them take lump sums at the end of it, which basically defeats the object. And when I talked to the treasury modelers about this, I said, well, you're setting up incentives for people to take lump sums when they retire and so that they're eligible for the means-tested age pension, which is what the pension scheme is for. And uh, I can talk about Australian Treasury people because they're, you know, across the water. And they said, oh, people won't do that, will they? <laughs> you know? Well, again, uh, it was an ideal opportunity to do some lifetime modeling. And uh, we found, indeed, um, by looking at a, a whole range of what I call pass through the maze, it confirmed that there were very strong incentives for people to uh, take these lump sums. Not only that, but there's an incentive for people to retire early too. If you have a compulsory scheme that makes people save more than they otherwise would save, then their reaction would be, well, uh, actually I can retire earlier than I thought. So there's an incentive for early retirement there. So you could say that um, there were some unintended consequences of this policy that some basic um, microeconomic modeling and simulation analysis uh, was able to throw some light on. Um, okay, I'm, I'm coming, uh, I'm gonna rush through the end bit here. I'm just gonna talk about one more thing because um, again, New Zealand has a big, a big role here. I mentioned the uh, significance of the paper that I was asked to write about welfare changes. Before then, in the mid-90s, I was asked to write a review for the Treasury, again, New Zealand Treasury, of um, income dynamics. They had a number of questions about this because they were concerned. They were saying, well, we measure inequality usually uh, in annual income terms, but people experience these changes from year to year. Uh, surely we should be looking at a longer period measure of income. Uh, we should be concerned with the way people's incomes change from year to year. There were no data at the time. And so when I did this review, I also suggested that uh, it would be possible to produce uh, quasi-longitudinal data by linking tax information. And uh, remarkably, they, they agreed with this. I, I was invited um, to come and talk to what I thought would be half a dozen people to persuade them of this. And I, I got into the Treasury and, um, and my first visit, and I was told, well, let's go, to the, let's go straight to the room. And we walked into the room, and there were about this number of people waiting for a lecture. And uh, any of you, uh, those, of, those who know the person involved will know that it's very easy to uh, get these kind of misunderstandings, but I won't mention him publicly. Uh, but, I, but I had to wing it for an hour, uh, but fortunately it was sufficiently persuasive and we got, um, we got this longitudinal data, uh, which proved to be very valuable. And I'm pleased to say that um, we have the opportunity these days to do much more interesting work in New Zealand on income mobility. This, this work um, enabled us to do uh, quite a number of projects. I've really been given, I'm worried here about going over time, so um, I'm, I'm gonna rush through here. So you just have to believe me when I said it led to lots of fruitful projects. <laughs> It wasn't the play um, toy shop at all. Um, lots of applications. And uh, I'll just mention one more kind of model very briefly. I talked about income taxes and labor supply. I uh, haven't mentioned consumption. But of course, another kind of simulation model is to simulate uh, changes in demand when prices change as a result of indirect taxes. And I built a, a model that I called this DOORS, Demand and Welfare Effect Simulator. And uh, it, it was used, uh, one of the first uses to which we put this model um, was to look at the effects of introducing GST in Australia. 
And uh, some of you may remember that uh, GST was introduced in Australia in the year 2000. It replaced a whole range of indirect taxes, a really complicated uh, set of indirect taxes. But there was a big debate. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the people just didn't look to see what New Zealand had done. Uh, and there was a big debate about taxing food. Uh, the usual argument, uh, food uh, comprises a higher proportion of expenditure of low-income groups, so GST is, um, is regressive, isn't it? Uh, and we should correct for this by exempting food. Uh, this is a rather tired old argument, which uh, one can look at using very sim simple models. But actually, you get, it's more persuasive if you, if you look at a large micro-simulation model. The first thing we had to do was to work out what the GST would imply for changes in the food price. What, what were the old taxes actually implying? Now, they were not transparent at all because they were input taxes. So you needed input-output matrix to, to get a hold of them. And we found that actually... Um, I'm running through this very quickly. There was an effective tax rate on food of 13%, actually 13.5% with the old taxes. So you had a system that taxed food at a higher rate than the GST was going to impose. And people still thought this was a terrible thing uh, to put the tax on food. And, of course, you're talking about changes in uh, a whole load of taxes that were not really very visible uh, to imposing a tax that was highly visible. Uh, of course, we know um, that the reason for eventually exempting food was political, uh, had nothing to do with economics. I, I actually had a conversation with a leading lobbyist in Australia where I put some of these points, and she said to me, yes, I know, you're absolutely right, but I can't say that publicly. And I, th I thought this was pretty disgraceful, but uh, anyway. Um, and we have this kind of debate surfaces in New Zealand every now and again. People say, oh, the GST is increasing in New Zealand uh, from its original level, and so this makes the regressivity worse, and there'll be pressure to ex exempt food. And so, again, we found it quite useful to actually put this kind of thing through this micro-simulation model to show that Exempting food is really a very, very poorly targeted kind of policy. And if you're concerned with redistribution, you do it much more effectively um, through uh, benefit payments. OK, so I'm, I'm going to skip through a load of stuff and get to the end here. Uh, so uh, looking forward. Well, I've talked about the kind of uh, models that I think are of practical use and that have longevity. So they need resources. They need access to micro data. It's really not surprising that the majority of these models are built and operated in government departments uh, or, in the case of Australia, by the Melbourne Institute. It's not really feasible for... Um, people to get grants to do this kind of thing in an ordinary economics department. And there are problems of uh, maintenance and dissem dissemination of the results. Government departments um, take different views at different times. Uh, managers change. Um, whole, I, could, I could talk forever about this problem. Uh, but pro these models become at risk in government departments. And also, those departments are not able to disseminate the, all the results unless you want to, do an, uh, unless you want to um, put in a request. Um, so it leads me to the question, is there a role for an Institute of Fiscal Studies type of centre? The Institute for Fiscal Studies in London has been going for a long time now. Uh, they do some exemplary modelling work, and they are able to provide independent assessments. And uh, it would be wonderful if we had uh, this kind of funding for this kind of institute. I don't think it will ever happen um, here. But um, one thing that we, we are trying to do, and this is in collaboration with Norman Gemmell, uh, chair of public finance at VUW, 
um, we are trying to do a, a collaborative exercise where we uh, work on and enhance the Treasury's model and Australia's model. I should have said, by the way, that Australia's model, MITS, was bought by the Australian Treasury. Uh, so I, I kind of feel a personal responsibility for all these models. Uh, and I mentioned uh, income mobility. Uh, another project which I'm very excited about is basically going back to my first work and looking at uh, income mobility using a much, much richer data set. So uh, I think that's a point at which I land, but I, I do hope that I've convinced you that uh, there are economic models that can belong to the workshop uh, and not the toy shop. Uh, maybe not to this kind of super duper workshop, uh, which makes me very envious, but um, to the economic policy workshop to enhance, again, my hobby horse, rational policy analysis. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me. Good evening. Uh, kia ora, talofalava. Um, Bob Buckle is my name. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor and Dean of Commerce uh, at Victoria University of Wellington, and it's my pleasure to be able to offer some concluding remarks uh, following John's, uh, Professor John Creedy's lecture. Um, I first met John about um, 14 years ago, I'm glad he said the date he, joined, he came to Treasury in 2002. I thought it was somewhat earlier, but... Um, and uh, that was a time where both of us were recruited by the then Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Dr Alan Bollard, to join the Treasury uh, to provide... Um, well, to act as principal advisers and uh, generate... Uh, we were just told... We were asked to generate research that might inform policy advice and policy analysis. Um, and uh, what a privilege it was to be able to meet John. Um, uh, John, as you heard earlier, had previously been commissioned by Treasury to develop the equivalent of the, of the MITS model uh, for Treasury, Treasury purposes. Um, at the time, John and I uh, used to meet for lunch. I think it was weekly, and we'd um, uh, have lunch together and discuss the challenges of uh, economic modelling, of working within policy institutions and getting traction uh, through this work. Um, and John commented at the end about the transitory nature of these sorts of uh, initiatives within policy institutions. And I, um, I have to say, I think we uh, owe Alan a, a great deal of... Um, a great gratitude to kicking off that initiative for some years anyway. Um, but I'm, I'm delighted that this evening you've been able to gain some insights into how John has applied the tools of his trade to contemporary public policy analysis uh, and to public policy issues. John is a prolific researcher uh, and publisher. Uh, you may have got a hint of that from Professor uh, Fraser Allen's introduction. Uh, he is simply one of the leading um, uh, one of the leading in economics uh, publishers globally. Uh, his work has always been close to contemporary policy issues such as pension design, incentive effects of tax, uh, taxes, the distributional effects of taxes and tax policies, and much more. Uh, he has a great deal to say and has written a great deal about the history of economic thought, which influences the way he thinks about these issues. Uh, as you've heard tonight, John's approach has been to develop economic statistical models suitable to tackle the issues that he is focusing on and to derive meaningful policy insights and inform debate, but understanding the limitations. John is continually developing new models and communicating his insights um, to the research community, to policy advisors, and I should emphasise to future ge um, generations of economists and policy advisors. John does a great deal of work with, with young 
economists and young policy advisers. You just only have to scan his recent publications to see who his co-authors are. They're youngsters in their early 20s. Some of them look as though they were in their late teens to, to me. And, uh, and they are uh, developing and working collaboratively with John under his guidance and immen immense experience is, is coming through in, in that work. Uh, tonight we've heard John's views of the benefits and limitations of economic models. The challenges in designing the right horse for the, for the course that, that he is running. Um, the various ways that these models can be applied and how they can inform what he refers to, and I've, we've both used this term, rational policy analysis. We've also, yeah, that term has provoked sometimes strong reaction. But the point of the phrase that John, I think, help, has helped elaborate tonight is that you develop tools to try and generate meaningful insights to be able to inform decision makers about the implications and possible implications of alternative policy insights onto the various welfare and other effects that you might be interested in. <clears throat> And he has also explained the importance of careful design. We're, we've been fortunate at Victoria University of Wellington uh, that John was interested in returning to Wellington and being part of this rich policy environment and research environment we have got in Wellington and a joint uh, appointment with the New Zealand Treasury. He's a classic example of what we mean by developing a capital city civic university. And at the Victoria Business School, that is exactly the direction we've been developing, at least in the last decade. Uh, thank you, John, for an absorbing lecture. Uh, as always, I've enjoyed and learnt a great deal from, from your presentation tonight, as I have always done. Um, so please, on behalf of the, um, the University and the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Professor Fraser Allen, um, let me invite you to refreshments afterwards and can we please also um, express our thanks again to John, for John's lecture tonight. Thank you.